Welcome to Laws 13013, Legal Professional Conduct, Topic 11, The Adversarial System. I'm Stephen Colbrand. In this topic, we will introduce the fourth theme of the course, Duty to the Court. Here we're concerned with the question of what is meant by justice and access to justice. We'll look at the nature of the adversarial system in terms of its purpose and key players. The role of the courts in our common law system. Is that role a search for truth or a search for justice based on the evidence presented by each side? We'll look at the professional rules which regulate the activities of lawyers in terms of the litigation and prosecution of cases and in turn the role of the lawyer in the due administration of justice. This duty of the lawyer has often been described in terms of the duty of fairness and candour as reflected in the title for this topic. We will be looking at issues in terms of the following areas. Duty is of fairness and candour in negotiation. Diligence and the obligation not to cause unreasonable expense and delay in the litigation. The obligation not to interfere with witnesses or their evidence. The giving of undertakings to the court and the situation where a client confesses guilt. The reading for this week is found in Isaiah Ross, Essex in Law, Lawyers, Responsibility and Accountability in Australia, chapters 13, 14 and 15. After studying this topic, you should be able to assess the arguments for and against imposing a duty of fairness and candour in negotiations on legal practitioners. Understand the approach adopted in relation to the pursuit of hopeless cases. You should be able to outline the limitations the Queensland Barristers' Rules place on arguments that advance unsupported or irrelevant allegations. Critically evaluate the proposition that there is a relevant difference between failure to proffer relevant material and proffering false material. And you should be able to explain the position taken by the courts on the use of tricks to present or discredit testimony. We'll start off by looking at an outline of the adversarial system, one aspect of which is the due administration of justice. So what do we mean by the due administration of justice? At its base level, the notion of justice is all about equity, fairness and the rule of law. So what do we mean by the lawyer's duty to the due administration of justice? Essentially, it's the lawyer's professional responsibility to ensure that the method and processes in place for the determination of legal disputes or claims are fair, equitable, honest and speedy. Access to justice. The notion of equity in terms of access to justice involves a judgment about whether certain people stand in the same positions as others when they seek access to the courts or to the legal system or advice. One of the fundamental principles of the law should be that it applies equally to all people. However, this breaks down somewhat if circumstances are such that only those with sufficient financial resources are able to access the courts. Other access to justice issues include rights of people under a disability, those with age, language, or cultural disadvantages. Let's have a look at the adversarial and inquisitorial systems. The adversarial system reflects the view that the best way to do justice between the parties is for each of them to be represented and for each to put their best possible case before an impartial judge or jury who ultimately determines the final issue of liability. On this view, the question of where the truth lies is really of only marginal importance. The trial not being about the truth, but rather about finding or findings based on the evidence as presented. The role of the judge is limited on one view to be entirely passive and that the conduct of the litigation should be left entirely to the parties with the judge playing no part other than to control the admission of the testimony according to the laws of evidence. This is perhaps an unduly narrow view, as criminal cases such as the Crown and Apostolides, 1984, 154 Commonwealth Law Reports 563 indicate 
the trial judge may, but is not obliged to, question the prosecutor in order to discover the reasons which led the prosecutor to decline to call a particular witness, for example. At the close of the Crown case, the trial judge may properly invite the prosecutor to reconsider such a decision and to have regard to the implications as then appear to the judge at that stage of the proceedings. He cannot direct the prosecutor to call a particular witness and in exceptional circumstances, however, the judge may call a person to give evidence on their own motion. The trial judge is therefore not entirely passive in the system, as the initial definition suggested. The role of the barrister, in contrast to that of the judge, lies in balancing his duty to the court and the administration of justice to that owed to the client. The barrister is free from the allegiances and interests and closer and continuing associations which a solicitor has with the client. In the Australian Solicitor's Conduct Rules 2011, the duty to the client is captured in the prelude to Rules 7 through to 16 under the heading Relations with Clients. In terms of balance, the duty to the court can be found in Rules 17 through to 29. Have a look at those particular rules and you can see these counter, you know, counterbalancing factors, duty to the client on the one hand, duty to the administration of justice on the other. The barrister's rules are along similar lines. Consider rules 25 through to 36, dealing with frankness in court. In contrast to the adversarial system, the inquisitorial system in is a mode of dispute resolution in which the judge may assume responsibility for determining how the competing claims of the parties are presented by their legal representatives. Alternative dispute resolution. In further contrast to the approach of either the adversarial or inquisitorial systems, alternative dispute resolution has emerged as an option for parties to reach their own solutions. ADR incorporates concepts such as negotiation, mediation, which includes court annexed mediation, facilitation, mini-trial and arbitration. ADR offers an alternative to an adjudicated decision and many view the ADR outcomes as far better than any adjudicated decision. Rule 38 of the Bar Association of um, Queensland Barristers Conduct Rules imposes a duty upon barristers, barristers to inform their client and instructing solicitor about alternative dispute resolution. The equivalent solicitor's rule is found in 7.2 of the Australian Solicitor's Conduct Rules, June 2011. Furthermore, the object of the Civil Dispute Resolution Act 2011 Commonwealth, which came into force on the 1st of August 2011, is to ensure that as far as possible, people take genuine steps to resolve disputes before certain civil proceedings are instituted in Section 3. It imposes a duty on an applicant in court proceedings to file a genuine step statement at the time of instituting proceedings outlining what steps have been taken to resolve the dispute or why no steps were taken and there is a duty upon the lawyer to advise them of this requirement and to assist the client in preparing and filing the statement. We'll now move on to the duties of fairness and candour in negotiation. In dealing with the court, legal practitioners must at all times be competent, honest and candid. This obligation is detailed in the Statement of Principles found in Rules 4, which deals with other fundamental ethical duties, Rule 5, which deals with dishonest and disreputable conduct, Rule 22, which deals with false statements, and Rule 34, which deals with um, dealings with other persons. All of those particular rules, 4, 5, 22 and 34 of the Solicitor's Rules, uh, focus on this notion of fairness and candour. So let's look at the notion of the duty of fairness in a little bit more detail. It can be really broken down into four subtopics. That is, those involving hopeless cases and unreasonable expense or delay, 
unsupported or irrelevant allegations, insults, intimidation and obfuscation, and direct communication with other parties or their witnesses. Let's look at each in turn. Firstly, hopeless cases, unreasonable expense or delay. Australian Solicitor's Conduct Rules 2011 provide detailed rules concerning communication of advice, Rule 7, undertakings, Rule 8, and communication with another solicitor's client, Rule 33. Make sure that you read Rules 7, 8 and 33 and are familiar with, the, and are familiar with their contents. Several barristers rules likewise are designed to achieve the efficient administration of justice including in Rule 56, a requirement for timeliness. In Rule 57, identification concisely of the issues in dispute, how evidence would be limited and how to efficiently use court time. And Rule 58, information concerning adjournments, which needs to be provided. Moving on to unsupported or irrelevant allegations. Several barristers' rules are designed to limit unsupported or irrelevant allegations. These include Rule 63, where allegations and submissions must be supported by facts. Rules 59 through to 67, which deal with the responsible use of court process and privilege. And finally, Rules 68 through to 74, which deal with the integrity of evidence. So again, take your time go through those particular rules and become familiar with their operation. The third area of the duty of uh, fairness was insults, intimidation and obfuscation. Barristers Rule 59 provides that a barrister must take care to ensure that the barrister's advice to invoke the coercive powers of the court is reasonably justified by the material already available to the barrister, is appropriate for the robust advancement of the client's case on its merits, is not made principally in order to harass or embarrass the person, and is not made principally in order to gain some collateral advantage of the client or the barrister or of the instructing solicitor out of court. So there are limits in terms of insults, intimidation and obfuscation. The last area in the duty of fairness was that involving direct communication with other parties or their witnesses. The doctrine of fairness requires lawyers to be careful in their communications with other parties or their witnesses, and that with certain exceptions there is a general prohibition on communication with the opposing party. The purpose of the restriction as stated by the professional bodies is the fear that such communications by a lawyer will tend to intimidate, coerce or harass. In all dealings with witnesses, care needs to be taken so that it cannot be said that the practitioner was attempting to influence the evidence of that witness. The authority for that is Kennedy and the Incorporated Law Institute of New South Wales, 1939-14 Australian Law Journal, 563. There is a general um, prohibition against direct communication with other parties. See Australian Solicitor's Conduct Rules 2011, Rules 22.4 and 33.1. With respect to the Barrister's Rules, look at Rules 68 through to 74, which deal with the integrity of evidence. While there is no property in a witness, and nothing wrong with a practitioner informing a witness that he or she need not agree to be interviewed, Attempting to persuade a witness not to give evidence may amount to perverting the course of justice. And that is something you definitely wish to avoid. Let's think about now dealing with witnesses and the witness box in particular. The rule in Brown and Dunn, 1894, Sixth, Sixth the Law Reports, 67, requires counsel where it is to be contended that the evidence of the witness should not be accepted to put to the witness the facts and circumstances by reason of which that evidence might be attacked so that the witness may have the opportunity of offering an explanation. Solicitor's Rule 21.8 
without limiting the generality of the earlier Rule 21.2, in proceedings in which an allegation of sexual assault, indecent assault, or the commission of an act of indecency is made, and in which the alleged victim gives evidence, in those circumstances, a solicitor must not ask that witness a question or pursue a line of questioning of that witness which is intended to mislead or confuse the witness, to be unduly annoying, harassing, intimidating, offensive, oppressive, humiliating, um, or repetitive. Humiliating or repetitive. And 21.8.2, a solicitor must take into account any particular vulnerability of the witness in a manner and tone of the questions that the solicitor asks. Barrister's Rule 61 is in the same terms as that Rule 21 found in the solicitor's rules. Furthermore, Rule 21.5 of the solicitor's rules provides that a solicitor must not make a suggestion in cross-examination on credit unless the solicitor believes on reasonable grounds that acceptance of the suggestion would diminish the credibility of the evidence of the witness. Barrister's Rule 66 is, is in exactly the same terms. So that deals with the duty of fairness. We're now looking at the duty of candour. The court depends on the honesty and trustfulness of lawyers. Lawyers are only bound to the duty of candour to disclose things that they should or should have known in relation to the subject matter. This is in addition to the requirements of the procedural rules. Duties of candour may be broken down into four subtopics. Firstly, failure to proffer material generally. In this respect, have a look at Barrister's Rules 32 through to 36, 59 and 60, and 78 through to 80. The passive withholding of material is permissible, but active concealment or misleading the court is prohibited. Failing to proffer material to regulatory bodies. A conflict may arise between an adversarial position and that of cooperation with a regulatory body, for example, the taxation office. So you need to be very careful in relation to this particular area. Proffering false material. Barrister's Rules 12, 59 through to 67, and 80 deal with this issue. You should also have a look at Myers and Elman. 1940 Appeals Cases 282 at 292, where a cost order was made against a solicitor for making false allegations. The last aspect of the duty of candour relates to tricks in presenting all discrediting information or materials. Defence counsel are entitled to test the prosecution evidence and have the prosecution prove its case. There's nothing wrong with that. This includes testing the character of witnesses. And there are particular barrister's rules concerning this, 66, 82 and 83. Taxic tactics used in testing may include playing on an emotional weakness of the witness, class and racial prejudices, and also sex appeal. Let's um, focus now on criminal trials. By way of a general but not definitive introduction to this section, you should read Barrister's Rules 68 through to 74, which prohibit coaching of witnesses and focus on the integrity of evidence, and also Rules 78 through to 81, which deal with delinquent or guilty clients. A common issue that arises relates to the question of perjury. If the client has committed perjury, or intends to commit perjury, counsel may refuse to take any further part in the case, unless the client corrects the perjury, or refrains from committing the perjury, and that's found in Bar Rule 78. If the barrister feels that the client may perjure themselves, they must counsel the client against perjury. What do you do when your client confesses guilt? It's often a concern for students that one may act for a guilty client who at his or her trial pleads not guilty. In fact, barristers cannot refuse to act for clients as we've seen. The Cabrank principle 
is designed to ensure that all who appear before the courts will be able to have legal representation. It's important in such a case to balance the obligations as a member of this special profession to provide legal representation to a client to enable the adversarial system to work and of course the other side being the obligation to the court not to mislead the court. Barristers must accept a proffered brief and put the prosecution to proof when acting for a guilty client. Solicitors need not accept a retainer to act for a client. However, if they have accepted a client, they should complete the retainer and not withdraw where the client will be left without adequately being represented. Three issues um, arise in respect of um, this matter. First, you may suspect but not know that the client is actually guilty. Unless you receive a confession, you cannot know the facts until they're found by the court. Second, where the client confesses, be sure it is an informed confession to the alleged crime, not just to certain facts. In other words, they may confess to certain facts, but those facts may not actually amount to a crime. Third, where you know the client is guilty, then you may still put the prosecution to proof, but I would suggest that you spend some time reading the case of Takia and the King, 1934, 52 CLR 335. Prosecutor's Rules Counsel for the prosecution are not to regard themselves as ministers for justice and should not strive for a conviction at all costs. So said the authority of the Queen in Bathgate, 1946, 46 State Reports, New South Wales at 281. In a criminal trial, the primary function of the prosecutor is to aid in the attainment of justice, not in securing a conviction. So this translates, translates to two areas of general responsibility. First, there is a duty on the prosecution to bring to the attention of the defence any material relevant to the defence. And you can see this in Bar Rules 86, 87 and 88. The second area of uh, special responsibility is in respect of calling of witnesses. The prosecution should call as witnesses all persons who are eyewitnesses to any events which go to prove the elements of the crime charged and any witnesses who are considered by the prosecutor to be material in the sense that their evidence is cogent, relevant and reliable. Lawyers generally are not under a duty to call witnesses or to disclose information that assists the opposition. It's just the prosecutors are in a different position. This was established by the case of the Queen against Apostolides, 1984 154 CLR 563. Now let's have a look at undertakings. Undertakings given by practitioners are taken seriously because they are officers of the court and because they will generally be held personally liable for any undertaking given on behalf of the client if the client subsequently breaches that undertaking. Personal liability will only be avoided if such avoidance is expressly disclaimed in the undertaking itself and this relates to the fact that the undertaking is construed as a contractual matter. The breach of which will sound in damages, or in the case of a broken undertaking given to the court, discipline by virtue of the court's inherent jurisdiction to discipline its own officers. The Australian Solicitor's Conduct Rules 2011 Rule 6 has a particular provision in relation to undertakings, and it says that a solicitor who has given an undertaking in the course of legal practice must honour that undertaking and ensure the timely and effective performance of the undertaking unless released by the recipient or by a court of competent jurisdiction. A solicitor must not seek from another solicitor or that solicitor's employee, associate or agent undertakings in respect of a matter that would require the cooperation of a third party who is not a party to that undertaking. Subpoenas. A subpoena is an order of the court which requires a named witness to attend the courtroom 
either for the purpose of giving oral evidence or for the purposes of producing documents to the court or both. The sanction for failure to comply with a subpoena may include a penalty or even imprisonment. This procedure is of critical importance to the routine operation of the adversarial system as we know it. And you'll do more work in relation to subpoenas in the civil procedure subject. So, legal practitioners have an important role to play in the adversary system and the overall administration of justice. As Chief Justice Mason noted in Gianelli and Wraith, 1988-165-CLR-543 at page 558, the advocate is an essential participant in our system of justice, as are the judge, the jury and the witness, and his freedom of judgment must be protected. This topic has introduced a number of ethical obligations that the law and the profession place upon lawyers. These have been noted in the context of the adversarial system. In respect of prosecutors, we've also noted special duties which attach to that position so that in criminal proceedings there is a minimum possibility of an injustice occurring. At the end of the day, it all comes back to a respect for the administration of justice and the notion of honesty. What we've tried to do here is to establish the framework in which litigation takes place. This framework is the adversarial system which seeks a just resolution by having an impartial and largely passive judge or a judge and jury hearing all of the evidence as it's presented by the parties and deciding the matter in accordance with the law and the rules of evidence. The way the system works and the rules concerning the admission of evidence restrict the ambit of the case. However, quite apart from this, the professional responsibility of lawyers in the adversarial system involves the question of balance. A balance as between their duty to the administration of justice, reflected in their duty to the court, and to their duty owed to the client. In some cases, these will be in conflict, and in such cases, the interests of the client has to give way. The rules of the profession reflect this balance and the paramount duty to the court. This concludes topic 11, the adversarial system. Next week we will be looking at some materials in relation to client interviewing.